Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, delighted to have Sanjay here talking about neuroscience. This is the second part of Understanding Us. Sanjay, take it away. Uh, thanks. So um, I'm not sure how many people saw the first one, but this is this is going to, I mean, a lot of the talks in, that, that I've done, they build up on each other, but I do go back and, and touch some of the topics that uh, uh, we discussed earlier. Um, so here, a lot of the, the discussion tonight is going to be new. Um, I will, in the beginning, give some introduction to um, things that we've talked about earlier. So, um, you know, it will be easier to follow if you uh, are familiar with what we discussed earlier, we went through. Uh, so let me, I'm going to start the slideshow. I have a, a presentation that I think would make it easier to, to follow. So does everyone see this? Yes. Great, thanks. So um, I was trying to make my screen. I have these pop-ups. Anyway, uh, all right. So um, first, what I'll, let me go into, I'll just briefly give an outline on what we'll talk about today. So there, there's two main things that I wanted to talk about. One is, an idea about the brain and the complexity of the brain. And the main, the top level idea is that the brain consists of multiple systems and subsystems. Um, you know, we think of it as a single organ, but it's actually much more complicated than that. So that's one aspect we'll go into. Uh, another aspect is we're, we're going to look at complex behavior. And these two are actually, these two ideas, the, the fact that the brain is, is a multi-level system and uh, this idea about complex behavior, they are interrelated. And that's the reason why I, I have these together. Um, and it will be easier to explain them together um, in this talk. So we'll go into what complex behavior is. And then we'll formulate um, some basic conceptual models uh, for each of these. One is for the brain as a multi-tiered system uh, composed of subsystems. And the second will be to explain complex behavior. Uh, and then after that, what we'll do is we'll have, we'll have a breakout session that, that um, actually this one, this, this, Originally, I thought of it as a breakout session, but what we'll do is we'll, we'll walk through this ourselves. There's a separate breakout session I'll have, but we'll walk through this, um, and this will help people to understand exactly what uh, some of the ideas that we're talking about. So there's a simple example that we'll have here, a scenario, and we'll follow through with that. So um, first of all, when we talk about a model, right, uh, because we're going to formulate two different uh, simple models. So what is a model? What, what exactly is a model? So um, Models generally, they, they try to explain an area of knowledge. They try to um, build a, a simple way of understanding all of the elements of, of that behavior, of that uh, area of knowledge. And they help us to, um, you know, to, to, if the model is correct, it actually can help us to extrapolate information. Um, it can help us to learn and it obviously helps us to understand if the model is correct. So the models are important in many, for many purposes, but um, it's very difficult to form a model unless you already have some bit of knowledge about the area that you're talking about. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm going to give two different models on these two ideas that I think hopefully will help people going forward to understand more about the brain and more about psychology and, and the neurosciences. Um, so model basically, it, uh, the model that we're talking about, the first model, will be about the brain and its its uh, uh, complexity. So in this case, we want this model to explain most behaviors that we have. Um, we want it to encompass any individual um, up to all of humanity. So the model should be able to represent um, the brain and the behavior of any single person, but also it should be broad enough that it, it applies to basically all of humanity. Um, so it needs to encompass all of human diversity. That's a pretty pretty large um, goal, but you know it can be done. Uh, and and you know talking about diversity, it, it it has to deal with all ages. It has to deal with all physical conditions and mental conditions that people may have. Uh, it has to account for temporary situations and permanent situations. Uh, it also has to deal with these things that we call the subconscious and conscious mind, um, and they drive motivation, subconscious and conscious. Uh, aspects of our mind uh, create motivation, they create behavior. So it has to be able to handle that. 
and has to address simultaneous emotions and thoughts, because that's actually one of the things that we're going to go into more today, um, that most of the time our brain actually has multiple emotions and thoughts in it at the same time. Uh, next, we want this model to be simple enough. And uh, so simple basically means we want to be able to communicate it to a typical teenager. That's, you know, describes the level of simplicity we're talking about. And we, wa we want it so that it can show us how to change and improve our behavior. This is one of the things that I hope, you know, by forming these simple models, um, people can get a better understanding of how, uh, you know, they themselves behave. And when they see others, it can help them. And then maybe, you know, at least for themselves, it can help them to uh, improve their own behaviors if, if that's a goal for themselves. We all have typically have goals like that. So that, that may help. Um, so first, let's go into the, the brain and how it's organized in systems and subsystems. And this is really a comprehensivist idea of, of systems. So um, the brain is a system. So first, we'll start at a pretty high level view. Um, of, of brain complexity. And, and first, before we delve too far into this, let me explain about the brain that when we talk about the brain, I'm talking specifically about what's inside of our, our cranium. Um, there are many, many versions of, of a concept of the brain. One of the concepts that, that many people have uh, you know, talked about is, is this concept of a, of a head, a heart, and gut, that our brain is, is uh, uh, distributed throughout our body. And in one sense, that's true. But here, I'm, I'm more specific because um, the brain really has to have a certain number of neurons. It has to have a certain size. Excuse me. And, and any brain that we have in our heart or in our gut doesn't meet that criteria. It's not large enough. It doesn't have enough processing capability to really be the brain that we're talking about. So I'm limiting this to only the brain that's inside of our, inside of our head. Second, um, the brain is, is an organ system. I'm sure many people have heard of this. What this means is that... Um, it's a system that integrates with our body, with our physical body, and it's mainly it, it deals with commun information, communication and information, and it transfers information between our body to our brain, and from our brain back to our body. It's it's a two-way communication. Um, one important part of this organ system is what we call the central nervous system, and that's basically the brain and then the spinal cord, just these two components. And another part is the peripheral nervous system. This splits into many different subsystems, which I won't go into tonight. But um, basically, the peripheral nervous system integrates very tightly into our body. Um, as our body grows, you know, before we're a baby, when, you know, when, when we're in utero, it, it grows. And the nervous system actually integrates into all of our organ systems throughout our body everywhere. So it's very tightly coupled. And the peripheral nervous system connects into the spinal cord and through the spinal cord, it connects into the brain. So all of these um, aspects together form this organ that is our nervous system. Um, and the brain is, is a major part of that. And the purpose of the brain is really, and some of these things we talked about earlier, but um, you know, these are four basic purposes of, of our nervous system. One is survival, um, and survival in the sense of not only um, our physical survival, you know, of getting food and, and, and looking for shelter and things like that, but even at a more primitive basic level, survival in the sense that keeping our body regula temperature regulated, right? So we have to have our body warm. If, if we're outside with and we forgot our jacket, our body has to figure out and kind of raise its own body temperature and, and it may make us shiver. So that's an aspect of survival. Our heartbeat, you know, our respiration, it controls many physiological functions. So that's an aspect of, of survival. Um, awareness. Um, our body uh, or mind has to be aware of what's happening inside of our body, as well as what's happening outside of the, our body. And it has to use that information to do various things. Um, third, it, has to, it, it needs to be able to do planning. And, and this, the planning, the last two are really more for people. I mean, the first two apply to most animals. The third applies to some animals. And the fourth is, actually, the fourth also applies to most animals. Um, so the planning is, is complicated because you have to have a concept of time. You have to have a concept of history. But again, th this and, and, and what you want to do, you have to have goals. So this is, it can be very complicated, but you know, at a simple level, planning can be as simple as um, you know, uh, picking up food before you chew it, that you don't basically you know, put your head on the ground, try to eat food. You basically pick it up with your hand and place it in your mouth. That is the simplest form of planning, which 
many of the um, uh, uh, mid-level mammals, you know, do they? They usually pick up uh, food either with their beak or with their with their uh, forearms. And then interaction with the world that that can be very complicated. But at a, at a simplest level, just walking ambulation is is interacting with the world. You have to know where you're walking. You have to know um, whether it's safe to walk. Um, things like that. So um, there, the, I created this grid which which helps to explain this, and it, it, we're going to tie this into the different parts of our our, our nervous system. So the rightmost column, there's five columns. The rightmost column is our nervous system and the different parts that we discussed earlier. And the left are the four different purposes that we talked about, survival, awareness, planning, and interaction. And here what I'm laying out is um, the level of involvement that each of these uh, parts of our nervous system has and kind of like the speed at which it, it, it acts and, and operates. So the first row is the peripheral nervous system. And it's primarily geared towards survival, and it operates very, very rapidly in the millisecond brain. Um, the next part of our, our brain and our, our uh, nervous system is, is the brain stem. And that interacts on the order of uh, minutes to hours. Um, and it uh, keeps us, uh, it keeps us uh, uh, for example, our, regulating our, our body temperature is something that it does our heart rate, heartbeat, um, respiration, these are all things the brainstem is involved in. So those two things are very, very important for survival. And then uh, another part, which is the, the paleomammalian cortex, which is kind of akin to the limbic system that we've talked about earlier. It's not exactly, but it's, it's, it's parallels. In, in neuroscience, there are actually many terms that are described in the terms that have overlapping meaning, but um, the paleomammalian system is actually more um, a description of the, the physiology, the physical uh, aspects of the brain, whereas the limbic system is more a functional description of it, but they have overlap. They're very similar to each other. And, and you know, so, so the, the paleomammalian system actually operates on the order of hours to days, and it's not very critical to survival. Um, it's less important because, you know, you have to survive, you know, hours to, you know, for many hours to reach the next day. And our brainstem, our peripheral nervous system is, is primarily uh, involved in doing that. And the same with the cortex. Cortex also is involved in, in survival, but it's much to a lesser extent. Then um, this aspect of awareness. And again, our peripheral nervous system is not very much involved with that. It is involved in the sense that it's, it's carrying information to our brain. So the transfer of information is, is, is it's always active for, um, but it's really not doing much with that information. It's simply just moving information from, let's say our eyes in, deeper into our brain. Um, the brain stem is, is much more involved in this and the, the polymimillion Cortex is much more involved in this, and the cortex is not as much with awareness. Although it is, I mean, when we get into topics of like consciousness, we talked about this at one point. I, I'd like to do a much more uh, detailed um, discussion on that later, um, at which we'll talk about consciousness and how it ties to awareness. But um, most of the time, our cortex is not really that much involved with awareness. Planning aspects, and this is where what you'll see is that the, the, the bold um, parts of this table are kind of moving in a bottom right direction, in a diagonal direction. That's because as we get into more complex behaviors, um, the more complex parts of our brain is involved in it. So of the four parts on the right column and the rightmost column, the peripheral nervous system, brainstem, allium mammalian cortex, and the cortex, these are progressively getting more complicated. So as we get more into planning and interaction with the world, um, you know, higher level behavior and higher level uh, parts of our brain need to get involved. So, um, and this I highlighted here in, in green. So roughly speaking, the survival mechanisms are auto auto autonomic. They don't require any thought. They don't require our brain to, us to really do anything other than us to be alive. And if we're, as long as we're alive, it kind of handles everything on its own. Um, the sensory system is always there. Um, and it's always, you know, while we're conscious and awake, um, it's always active and, and collecting information. Uh, the planning system is cognitive. It, it's where really thinking happens. And interaction is primarily motor control, but there's a little bit of cognition involved in that also. Primarily, it's motor control. And that's also in the higher parts of our brain. Um, so these break down into, into these four areas, which you know, we, we would call subsystems. And actually, of these four, the peripheral nervous system is really not a part of the brain. As we said at the beginning, we limited ourselves to only what's inside the, the, the skull, the cranium. 
So this really breaks down into, into just these three subsystems, which, is, which comprises our brain. Um, and this is a fairly simple view of the brain, but actually, you know, we'll go a little deeper into it because each of these subsystems actually have uh, greater complexity. They, they break down into, into smaller regions. So we'll, we'll go into some of that. So um, before we, we delve into those three systems, I wanted to talk about the development of the brain. So the complexity of the brain and the brain itself develops over time. It takes roughly 25 years from after we're born. Um, you know, some of you may have heard that, you know, only in our uh, early to mid 20s do parts of our prefrontal cortex, the, the, uh, the foremost part of our thinking brain develop. And that's really the reason why um, I'm saying that here, because that's the last part of our brain that actually finishes developing um, in, in our earlier uh, adult uh, period. Another aspect that's important, and, and these are some of the things that we've discussed earlier, but the brain development, the brain growth um, in utero and beyond, it follows in stages, it occurs in stages. So the brain actually, um, later on we'll talk about this, it splits into five different subregions, and each of those subregions grow at different rates. So it occurs in stages. And the growth of each of those stages and the stages together happens in something that follows the evolutionary sequence. And we've talked about this in an earlier uh, discussion where evolution really has shaped our DNA and our DNA is what causes our brain and our body to, to grow. And that DNA, because it was shaped by evolution, it actually makes our brain grow in a very similar to, evolutionary, to evolution uh, sequence. And uh, so these are important concepts to keep in mind over throughout. The, um, so it, the brain begins forming in utero. It's again, it's driven mostly by DNA. And as it's forming, um, remember that the body also is forming at the same time as the brain. The brain doesn't, doesn't develop as its own. So the brain and the body, the peripheral nervous system, they all integrate together in utero. Um, so you know, by the time a baby is born, everything that it needs um, initially is there. And after uh, the baby is born, it, you know, the brain actually continues to grow. So it's not that the brain fully develops before birth and then after birth, it's, it's kind of you know, almost fully grown. That's actually not the case. We talked about this earlier, that it, it reaches a certain stage of maturity um, before birth. And because of the way that, our, um, that uh, the female reproductive tract is and, and how the birth canal is, um, our brain physically stops growing intentionally. Our, our skull actually doesn't grow beyond a certain size because if it did, it would cause too much stress and possible damage to, to the mother and she may not, not survive. So for that reason, to, to make sure that the mother survives, our brain actually doesn't grow beyond a certain point and after birth, it continues growth. Um, so that's something that's important and not just growth physically, but actually maturity and developing in, inside this, the cranium happens. It continues for many months. So that's the reason why it takes around 25 years. So after nine months, we have a basic brain, which uh, you know, every infant has. And um, the environment and parenting are very important drivers for how it matures, um, for the maturity of the higher level systems of the brain to develop. It's very important, the environment and the parenting that, that uh, is available. Then the child, um, during their first initial years, around 10 years, a lot of the brain develops. Um, and it's, you know, the first around six, seven, eight years, um, a significant part uh, develops. Uh, now, one of the things that, that um, I wanted to, to make a distinction is the basic brain after a baby is born, baby is basically able to survive on its own only for a few weeks. If you didn't feed the baby and you did nothing to the baby, the baby was born and somehow it was just there, it would survive for a few weeks. Now, not a good situation, but it would, its brain would be able to keep it alive for a few weeks, although it would you know, be hungry and it would be crying and, and et cetera. A child, on the other hand, is able to survive for hours up to months because you know, presumably if it can access food, it would be able to you know, keep itself alive for a long time. Although the, limit of, the level of self-sufficiency that a child has varies on the type of behavior that we talk about. For example, most of... Uh, of us have seen children who, you know, a toddler or a one-year-old, if they don't see their parent, either parent or, or a caregiver, for more than, you know, half an hour, they get restless. And if it's more than an hour, they will become panicking almost. They need to see their parent within pretty much every hour. 
And so that aspect of a child's behavior is, is they're not self-sufficient at all. But other aspects of, of behavior, they're very much more self-sufficient. So there's a range. What we see is as we grow, the level of self-sufficient expands um, from hours. You know, in the beginning, it's only few weeks. It's, it's days to weeks. And then it grows from hours to months. And then in adulthood, which completes, you know, between 20 to 29 years, we typically get full self-sufficiency where we're able to take care of ourselves and do everything that we need to. Um, next, we'll drill down a little further and we'll go into a little bit more detailed view of, of the brain. And again, we talked about how it follows evolutionary stages. And also that formation of the brain actually follows functional needs. So the baby, by the time it's born, needs certain parts of the brain to be active. For example, it needs the brainstem to be active because the brainstem is one of the one of the parts that keeps the body alive, physically alive, you know, uh, minutes to hours, um, and so. And then, you know, other things that it does need. For example, a baby does not need to be able to think of mathematical formulas, so the level of cognition is not necessary. So that that's one of the last things to develop. So it follows functional uh, requirements, functional needs. Also, a lot of the parts of the brain, they develop in parallel, they grow in parallel, but they grow at different rates. And so, you know, as we talked about the, the brain stem, the brain stem will develop and mature first, while other parts of the brain continue to develop further, they develop at a slower rate, um, and they develop further, but the brain stem, after it finishes, it starts to do the heavy lifting of keeping the body alive. And that actually starts even before the baby is born, it actually, um, in the third trimester, that, that pretty much takes over. Um, and also, um, as these subsystems are, are developing parallel, they start to adapt to the external world. They start to adapt to um, many aspects of the physical world that we were born into. That's, that's actually one of the things that, that makes us all animals actually remarkable is that if we're born, for example, if we're born in a sub-Saharan African environment versus we're born in a Nordic, uh, in a very, very cold extreme climate um, or a very aquatic humid environment, our body and our mind and our, everything would adapt. Or if we're born in an area where the oxygen content, you know, a very high altitude environment, the, um, you know, uh, above uh, 15,000 uh, feet above sea level, you know, the oxygen content is so low that our brain would, would be starving of oxygen, but our body and our brain actually adapts um, based on where we're born. So there's a lot of adaptation that, that does happen. Also, what's happening is that um, as these systems, subsystems are developing, um, they start to overlap in function. They, they duplicate some aspects of each other. So the systems that are fully online and fully functioning, they're doing whatever you know, they're, they're there for. But the other parts of our brain that are developing behind, you know, kind of catching up and developing later, they also, they, see, each, each of these subsystems doesn't know about the other subsystem. They, they're kind of on their own. And so when, when you know, if you think, you know, I, I described there are five different subsystems in, in most mammals. I mean, when we're talking about the brain. Um, and so if you think about these five, the first one that develops is the brainstem. Actually, it's, it's the brainstem is, is divided into three parts. So the first part of the brainstem would divide, and we'll go into this a little bit later, but the first part of the brainstem uh, uh, forms and then it starts to become active. And then while that's happening, the second part of the brainstem is still in development. But while the second part of the brainstem is in development, it's trying to act and it may interfere with the first part of the brainstem. And it doesn't know that it's interfering. It's just trying to do what, what you know, it, it, the DNA is making it do. And the same with the third. The third part of the, of the brainstem may come online, and it may start to interfere also. And so there's overlap and interference that, that's happening all the time in the brain. So this is an important concept to understand. Um, and and this, these overlaps can be also cooperative in nature. They don't have to necessarily be um, disruptive. They can be disruptive, but they also can be cooperative. And, and actually, in a healthy brain, um, each of these different parts naturally learn to be cooperative in some sense. And the DNA actually has, has encoded that aspect also. So um, this is actually quite complicated. I'm not going to go too much into this. Um, so comp conflicts can arise, and this is another aspect. So here I'm talking more about after the brain has fully formed. Um, and after, you know, so for example, after a baby is born, um, one of the first things that happens after a baby is born is it comes out into this world, into this rather cold environment. It was inside the mother's uterus in a very warm, you know, pretty much 98.6 Fahrenheit environment. 
and all of a sudden it comes out into a 75 degree uh, ambient room temperature, a 20 degree drop instantly. That's cold. You know, if you go from you know, your current body temperature and you go into a cold shower, that wouldn't be, even be a 20 degree drop. So think about how it feels to go into a cold shower. That's what the baby experiences and you know, at birth. And, and, and that naturally would create conflict because what's happening is that the baby and its brain was in a state of uh, harmony. It was, it was in a relaxed, well, up to the, you know, the, the level that it's possible because the baby is being squeezed and it's deformed and you know, it's, it's discomforting. But after the baby's born, it, it relaxes. It's no longer um, in physical discomfort, but then it's, it feels this temperature. And, and all of these things cause conflict within different parts of its brain. And uh, so th this is, again, the, um, the slide that we looked at, the, the um, table that we looked at before. Um, these discomforts, again, are going to cause a lot of the same types of um, overlap between different brain regions, and uh, they need to be resolved. Um, because if, if they're not resolved, str stress, uh, stress is, is a physiologically, it's, it's a very harmful aspect of, you know, for us. Uh, our brain releases um, their different uh, neurotransmitters and the different um, uh, neurochemicals that, that are involved in stress, in sensing stress, but also in trying to alleviate stress and actually even informing stress. If, if our body has a stressful condition, it communicates to the brain and the brain um, activates parts of itself to make itself aware that there's stress somewhere in the body. So there are many types of neurochemicals uh, that, that are involved, but regulating all of those uh, stress conditions is very important in the brain. So all of these conflicts that arise, um, a very important part of what the brain needs to do, but in the beginning, it actually doesn't know how to do it. It has to learn this over time. Is it has to learn how to self-regulate a lot of these conflicts within itself. So um, there's a concept in, in medicine called homeostasis, which some of you may be familiar with. So homeostasis is where the body, so for example, the, the fact that our heart rate is at a constant temperature, uh, is a constant uh, rate, our body temperature is at a constant temperature, our respiratory rate is at a constant level, the volume uh, that we, resp that we uh, respond, you know, the inhalation, exhalation, volumes of our air, all of these things are aspects of our um, homeostatic uh, um, uh, regulation that our body does. And some of it, actually most of it is done by the lowest part of our brain, the, the brainstem. But similar to how our brain does this for our body, the brain actually needs to do it for itself. The brain also needs stability, especially when there's conflict that arises. And so this is a very important part of uh, concepts that I wanted to present to tonight. Um, so in the beginning, when the brain is immature, some parts of the immature subsystems will and do sometimes interfere with the mature subsystems, and that will cause conflict. Um, and even after the brain is fully developed, um, you know, even going through normal life, different parts of our brain will come into conflict with each other. So subsystems always conflict. They can they can always conflict, and so there's this there's this ability, excuse me, that we have to develop, and it starts to develop in our infancy very early, um, that we have to develop, which is this function of self regulating our our brain states, um, and that's that's fairly important. So we'll go a little further into into subsystems of the brain. Um, and what we'll do is first we're going to go into the brain, growing brain and specifically, uh, you know, the, we talked about the five parts of the, of the brain that form. Um, so DNA encodes the instructions on how to grow our brain. Okay, that, that's something that's very important. DNA is actually what makes our brain grow in very specific ways. It, it directs exactly what happens um, and, and how our brain grows. This starts in utero and continues, uh, for, you know, for the rest of our life. Um, Many of our DNA regions exist also in other mammals. Okay? They're very, very similar. So the formation of our brain is very similar to the formation of, of the brain of many mammals. Um, this makes our brain grow in very similar ways, sometimes nearly identical ways to other animals. So one of the things I want to talk about is, you know, in one of our earlier talks, we talked about the neural tube. And the neural tube forms um, fairly early on within about three weeks, and then it starts to differentiate. And so the neural tube is just a single tube um, 
And you know, earlier we talked about the uh, the sympath the the nervous the um, peripheral nervous system, spinal cord, and the brain. So this uh, this nerve this uh, neural tube actually first differentiates into a segment that will be the brain, um, and a segment that will be the uh, the spinal cord. And then there are um, uh, structures that uh, grow out that will form the uh, peripheral nervous system. But we won't go into those parts. We're only going to focus in on, on the brain portion, which is all the way at the end of, of that neural tube. The and neural tube is very long, and one end is corresponds to where our head would be, the, the rostral end. The other end is the caudal end, which corresponds to where we would have a tail. Actually, in our, in our uh, uh, evolutionary development, we actually have a tail in utero. That tail kind of disappears. It gets absorbed by our body. But we do have a tail. So the neural tube runs from the, our tail to our head. And the brain develops in the head region. We're going to do a little bit of, of looking into that. So the brain basically, this, this um, just have a very simple, very, very crude animation. I, I, didn't, I don't have very sophisticated tools to do this. So I'm trying to do this on, uh, in uh, PowerPoint. So the neural tube is growing five different sections of the brain okay, um, over time. And these five sections correspond to the, and from, from right to left is actually the simplest part to the most complicated part. So the right side is the, uh, the myelencephalon, the metencephalon, the mesencephalon, the diencephalon, and the telencephalon. So the rightmost three together form the brain stem. Um, the fourth from the right forms, you can say, you can think of it as the limbic system. And the, the leftmost, the telencephalon is what actually becomes our uh, the more complicated part of our brain, which which we have, uh, which is our cortex. Um, roughly speaking, this is how they how they they break out. And these five segments exist in in pretty much all mammals, all mid-sized to large mammals, even some of the, the very very primitive like rats, and they also have all five of these segments. So many many mammals have all five of these segments, and they actually grow very very similar to how they grow in us. Um, and the rightmost three grow very, very similar in pretty much all animals. Um, and then they stop growth um, in many mammals. And for, in us, they, they continue growing a little bit further. But basically, the type of brainstem that many mammals have are kind of sufficient for what we need. So they grow, and then they, you know, they grow a little more beyond what you know, uh, simple mammals have, you know, our, our primates and hominid. Uh, uh, sibling animals, sibling mammals, um, their brainstem is much more similar to ours. And ours is just a notch, a few notches, a little bit more advanced than, than theirs. Um, but for all practical purposes, they're very, very similar across all mammals. Diencephalon is actually where a lot of differentiation starts to happen between all, all the mammals. The telencephalon, which is the, the thinking cap, you can say that the, the cortex, those are all of the differentiation really occurs. The diencephalon is, is where, um, uh, and, and these are, are the more familiar names that, that you know, if, if you've studied the brain, more familiar parts of the brain uh, that they correspond to, the medulla oblongata, pons, the cerebellum, the pelium mammalian cortex, which actually is, consists of many, many subregions, uh, the thalamus, hypothalamus, um, the substantia nigra, many, many regions that, that form the, uh, the midbrain and the limbic system. And then the cortex is that topmost surface which is mostly um, white matter and gray matter. Um, and all of these parts, all of these five parts are very, very important. And, and what I want everyone to remember is that these five parts form over time. So the rightmost section um, starts to form first and, and it matures first, it finishes the growing first. And before it finishes the growing, the next section, the metaencephalon begins to grow. And while the metaencephalon is growing, um, the mesencephalon just is starting to grow, and they all grow in parallel. Um, and so the the rightmost region, the the you know the medulla oblongata will finish growth, and then the pons will finish its growth, and the cerebellum will finish its growth, while the the pelvic cortex is, is still growing, and the cortex may not even started at that point. And it continues on until all five of the regions have finished their. Actually, the, the cortex doesn't finish growth even after birth. This is something we talked about. Um, it, it continues growing for, for roughly 25 years. So that's the region that that's in humans is, is most complex. Well, it's most complex in every animal, but in humans, it's extremely complicated. And that's why it takes so long for it to grow. Um, 
we're going to run through very quickly this this uh, so we're going to not talk about all five of those regions. We're going to talk about just the right three most. Um, so the brainstem, the, the, actually the, the brainstem is all three of those right most sections combined. Okay, um, and the pallium. I, here I, I have this in uh, earlier. I had it right to left. Here I have it left to right. Sorry about that, but um, this not the slide. I, I wasn't able to change easily. Um, so anyway, the brainstem consists of the rightmost three that we looked at earlier. And then the paleomimillion cortex that we looked at, which is the diencephalon, and then the cortex. And you know, we're gonna just do a quick, quick synopsis of, of you know, the brainstem begins to form very early uh, in utero. It reliance on it begins immediately, and it doesn't have any aspect of learning. It's not something that does any learning. It it's one of those parts of our brain which basically it once it's there, it starts to act and it doesn't have to learn anything. It all of the functions that it needs to do come from DNA. The DNA encodes everything it needs to do, so it doesn't have to do any learning. Uh, so again, each of these subsystems are organized into multiple layers of multiple systems. So this is where I'm going to start to uh, explain that these three subsystems actually have further differentiation within them. So the brainstem has the medulla oblongata, the pons and the cerebellum. We looked at that earlier, right in the last slide. Now, the cerebellum actually has two hemispheres to it, the left and right hemisphere. Some of you may know about hemispheres, at least when we talk about the cortex, the cerebellum also has a left and right hemisphere. So that's an area where you know, already it's starting to split, right? Um, so attributes of the, of the left and right hemispheres is that there's symmetry um, in the sense that uh, they are both physically pretty much identical. There's no difference between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. And this is true not just of the, of the cerebellum, but also of the, of the cortex and the limbic system and other parts. You know, the, the, there, there's symmetry physically across the board. It's, it's pretty much identical. Um, now, one of the things that people may not realize is that in our brain, um, a lot of the signals, you know, our, our left half of our brain controls the right half of our body and the left, right half of our brain controls the left half of our body. Well, in the cerebellum, that's not the case. The cerebellum is actually um, ipsilateral. It, it, it controls the same side of the brain. Um, and the reason, and so the cerebellum is, is known as the, uh, the mini brain or the ancient brain, because a lot of the lower order animals don't have a developed cortex or limbic system. This, this is kind of all that they have. And so if you think of an earthworm or a fish or, or a, a, a centipede, right? The cerebellum does most of what they need to. So locomotion, the ability to walk, is actually one of the reasons why the cerebellum developed, because it, it provides us the ability to, to move on land or in water. And the reason why we have this left-right symmetry or why we have two hemispheres, this is suspected. There's, you know, we don't really know exactly, but this is a, it looks probably correct. But the reason why we have two hemispheres, and this begins at the cere cere cerebellum level, is because when we're walking, or if you want to think of it even simply, when you think of a fish moving in the water, its tail fin actually wrote, moves left, right, left, right. And that requires two different activities. You know, the ability to move toward the right and the ability to move toward the left. Now, it could be done using a single organ, a single brain hemisphere. But once, once you get to more complicated types of organs, organisms like, you know, like a centipede, which has many, many legs, right? Controlling all of those legs together is too complicated. So, you know, in evolution, our brain basically split itself into two parts. And so we have this, this uh, you know, bifurcated part of our brain. Um, although the, the medulla obligata and the pons, they don't split. They, they, they basically remain as one because they're the earliest part of our brain. And the DNA that encoded them formed so much earlier that, um, you know, the DNA doesn't edit itself and change itself. So once it's formed, once, excuse me, the DNA formed for the medulla obligata and for the pons, it's there, it's stuck, we're kind of stuck with it. Um, and that's the reason why we only have one of those, we didn't develop two. Although we could develop two if there was a major need for it, but there also has, has not been a need for it evolutionarily. Another attribute is that, you know, we talked about the left-right symmetry of, of the cerebellum's uh, two hemispheres. There actually is asymmetry when it comes to function, functionality. And that's the reason why, um, if you look at any animal when they walk, right, left and right feet, walk in opposite directions, and there's asymmetry there. And that's necessary because 
that's how you walk. You know, you, if, you, if both legs move together, you really wouldn't be able to ambulate very well. So, um, th and, and this is also, you know, this gives rise to handedness, you know, when we're right-handed, left-handed, things like that. So, so there's asymmetry also in, in the two, two uh, hemispheres when we're talking about the functions or the abilities of, of uh, those, uh, those parts. Um, so I, in the table, I added a fourth row here, which again is, uh, describes the, the, symmetry, the hemispheres. So the hemispheres also begin to form. So the brainstem doesn't have, um, it, well, two parts of the brainstem doesn't have any hemisphere, only the cerebellum, which is the third part, has it. So um, there's part symmetry there. The next part of the brain that forms is the paleomimillian cortex. It begins to form between the first and third, it begins to form the first trimester and then finishes by the third trimester. Um, there's minimal reliance on it in utero and there's minimal learning that happens. Although it does have two parts to it, it, it does have a left and right hemisphere. And then the cortex, again, it begins to form in the later stages. Um, the, uh, the fetus barely relies on it and, and there's really no learning that happens. And it also has uh, two um, hemispheres. Um, then after the baby is born, um, I just wanted to give an example of, of the same thing. Um, the brainstem has, uh, so, so the first row talks about um, whether each of these sections of the brain, each of these subsystems of the brain um, need, can function on their own or whether they need to interact with other parts of the brain. The brainstem does not need any other part of the brain to function. It it's, uh, can do every, everything it needs to do by itself. The paleomimillian cortex is not the same. It, it actually needs the brainstem to function a little bit. It can do a lot of things on its own, but it does need the brainstem to function. And the paleomimillian cortex is, what it does is it, it, it causes things like the fight or flight response or the freeze response. It causes us like the you know, panic reactions or um, you know, when we sweat um, or uh, you know, the adrenaline, uh, when, when our body gets flooded with adrenaline and, and raises our uh, uh, you know, blood pressure and, and our heart rate, and basically in preparation for a fight or flight or, or freeze response, fight or flight response actually. Um, so the brain controls that, the pelvic cortex of the brain controls that. And to control it, it has to send those signals through the brainstem. So there's a little bit of interaction with the brainstem, but it's not a whole lot. And the cortex definitely needs all of the other brain stems. So there's a high level of dependence. As we get into the higher levels of the brain, they rely much more on the, simple, the lower levels of the brain. Um, the next, uh, the thir third row is interaction between these brains. Again, the brainstem doesn't interact much with others. Um, the paleomimal cortex does interact a lot and, and the cortex, it has slight interactions. And th this is with, uh, between all of the brain regions. Um, the next row, is whether uh, the brain subsystem can or does learn to regulate itself or regulate conflicts with other uh, regions. And the brain stem does not need to. It, it's, it's whatever it needs to know, the learning that it has is permanent. It doesn't learn anything else. So it doesn't effectively have a way of regulating itself. Um, how you mean the cortex? Yes, it does. And the cortex has, has a slight ability. In the beginning, it, it's very, very slight, but over time it learns. After the baby is born, it starts to learn more and more how to regulate with other brain regions. And I put this in because consciousness is something, one of those things that you know, a lot of us have interest in. Um, and the brainstem has very little to do with consciousness other than the fact that you know, our body is, is uh, not in a coma. To that level, the brainstem is involved in consciousness because while we're not in a coma, we can be conscious. So um, that's the, the closest level. Um, Paleomimillian cortex um, is involved much more. It, it's involved in consciousness because it's able. It, it's looking at. Um, it's taking stimuli from our environment, from our sensory input, and it's making decisions and it's, it's uh, tuning into aspects of the world. And the cortex definitely is involved in that. Um, so we talked about their brain being composed of multiple subsystems: uh, the brain stem which uh, cerebellum has uh, one part of it. Now, cerebellum, actually, some people consider not part of the brainstem. It doesn't really matter. You can think of it as part of it or not. The cerebellum has a left and right hemisphere. 
diencephalon, which is the, um, you can think of it as a limbic system, the, the paleomammalian cortex. Um, and this also has uh, hemispheres, the hippocampus. Uh, it has uh, many gyri and nuclei. So the cerebrum, which is the cortex, um, and this has a left hemisphere, the right hemisphere has corpus callosum, which is the, um, the commissures, they're basically um, nerve bundles that connect the two halves of the hemisphere. Um, and each of these, and some of these parts of our brain actually have sub-regions which are more specialized, especially the cerebellum, uh, uh, sorry, the cerebrum and the diencephalon. The, the limbic system and the cortex, they both have a lot of sub-regions which are more uh, specialized. I won't go into those right now. But that's, this is just important to know that the brain, once we start to look at it, you know, th these five regions that we talked about, uh, other than the first two, the other parts of them break down into multiple sub-regions. And the, court, the cerebrum has many, many, many different regions. Um, you know, each, each half of the, uh, each hemisphere of the, of the cerebrum, of the cortex, um, has the frontal lobe, it has the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, and, and there are actually many more. These are the or uh, primary lobes that we talk about, but there are actually many more that they can be broken down into. So the brain actually is this multi-tiered organ that consists of many different regions, and each of these regions are specialized in many ways, and they uh, interact and, and uh, compete and uh, cooperate and conflict with many of the other regions. So that's the model that I wanted to, to come up with at this point. Um, and so we're talking about the number of subsystems. So the brainstem itself has two subsystems. The cerebellum has two. Or sorry, the brainstem has three. The cerebellum has two. The diencephalon has two. The cerebrum has three. So already we're talking about roughly eight to ten subsystems in the brain. And and when you get into dividing the cerebrum's left and right hemispheres into the four lobes and etc., you get beyond ten. Yeah. So um, it's important to understand the brain actually has many many regions. So in this in this talk, I'm going to talk about up to fourteen regions. That's sorry. There's an editing mistake there. That uh, we got. So, so the brain has eight to ten subsystems organized in a hierarchy. Um, it follows the evolutionary sequence. They grow sequentially. Um, we're just summarizing here, and they interact and or and or interfere with each other, causing stress. And these conflicts are normal. This is a normal part of our brain's function. I want people to understand that this is not something that's uh, unusual or or that it it indicates any uh, uh, abnormality. It's it, this is normal. This is happening all the time in us, in every person's brain. Um, while they're, even actually when, when they're asleep, this is, is happening. Um, and the brain learns over time. The, one of the main things it learns to do is to, it learns to self-regulate a lot of these conflicts and stress. This is one of the, the essential parts that, uh, that's important. And these complex imbalances between the, let's say, 10 that we've seen so far, these 10 mini brains, is actually what causes complex behavior. So we're getting a little bit into that second topic that we talked about in the beginning of complex behaviors, right? So let's start looking at complex behaviors now. Right? Uh, Sanjay, what's a good point for uh, people to ask questions? Actually, let's do that now. Let's let's uh, do a question and answer now. I think this is okay. Good. Excellent. So, folks, uh, if you have questions, we have the four rules. Uh, go ahead and type exclamation mark in chat uh, or raise your hand in Zoom. Rule number two, uh, keep on topic. Rule number three, be brief. Just focus on questions at this point. And it's a long presentation. Sanjay is covering a lot of ground. So try to keep your questions brief so we can get to as many questions as possible and move on to the next one. So it's gonna be Joe followed by Claudio. Joe. Yeah. Um... Thanks, Sanjay. Uh, this is a lot of information, so uh, I'm just going to try and break it down simply. So if we look at the brain as a system and the subsystems to explain complex behavior, traditionally, like when you look at systems and you treat an independent part uh, or a part independent of the whole, that the whole totally suffers. So the idea of how do you then separate the brain from some of the other subsystems that you had noted, specifically the gut, because the gut has been like known to impact individuals' moods, uh, behaviors, their mental health, 
So how do you explain the whole when you, when you, or how do you, you know, take the independent part of the brain and then explain the system as the, like, and doesn't that, how do you get to the whole explanation of explaining complex behavior if you're not going to talk about the gut? And could you at least comment on the gut's role in that process? Definitely. So, um, I mean, I, I excluded uh, the gut and other parts of our, our uh, visceral body um, intentionally, but that's, there, there's a reason for that. And so many parts of our body have actually neurons in them, not just the brain. We have neuronal clusters throughout our body in various different regions. Um, so there's something called an enteric uh, nervous system, which is, which is kind of the gut. And when we talk about the gut brain, that's the system that we're talking about, the enteric nervous system. And so when we feel queasy or nauseous or um, butterflies in our stomach, that's the part of our nervous system that's, that's active and doing that. Um, and, and, but what's distinct and what's unique is that all of those other parts of our nervous system that are in our body don't have a lot of neurons. The number of neurons are, are relatively speaking, they're, they're, they're much less than what the brain has, much, much, much less. They're on the order of what a worm would have. Okay? So in the sense that what a worm can do, our gut can do that. So a worm can wiggle. And in a sense, when our digestive system actually functions, our digestive system actually wiggles. And when we swallow, the swallowing reflex and swallowing uh, control is exactly what a worm's body does, what our esophagus does, it's similar to, to our uh, um, uh, intestines and other things. So, so one of the things to understand is that the information that's contained within our gut um, is there's not a lot of processing that happens in the gut. The processing actually happens in our in our brain. So that any information, any uh, awareness um, that happens in our gut gets sent to our brain, gets processed in our brain, and then it gets sent back to the, to the gut or other parts of the body. So there's this two-way um, communication that's always happening in our body. So when we talk about the gut, the gut by itself doesn't do a whole lot of thinking or complex behavior. It relies on, on parts of our brain, especially lower order parts of our brain, um, to do that. I and mean, some of it's fairly automatic. Also, another, another thing that to help explain your, your concept is that there's a lot of redundancy built in. You know, a lot of systems that don't have redundancy, if you take away one part of that system, the whole system might fail, right? But in our body, one of the reasons why it doesn't fail as, as drastically is because there's a lot of redundancy built in. We have left and right hemispheres. And one of the videos that, that um, I linked to, you know, there, there was where a woman, when she was a baby, an entire half of her brain had to be removed for medical reasons. Okay? And she survived. That's a drastic, drastic change. But she was almost normal. And from outward appearances, she looked very, very much like a normal person. And in the video, actually, she was talking and she was a very positive you know, person, you can tell by her demeanor, in spite of that. And she had uh, very few, she did have some impact, but, but relatively speaking, it, it was amazing how little impact there was, even though half of her brain was gone. Um, so that's the level of redundancy that we have in our brain. So when we're talking about removing parts of it, um, it does it cause impact, but there are other parts that can take over. Next up is going to be Claudio, uh, Monica, Vanessa, and Kevin. Claudio. Yes, uh, very interesting. Uh, you may have answered it partially, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, regarding the uh, left and right hemispheres, in the event uh, either one of them gets permanently damaged, um, is it possible for the brain, at least in rare cases, to be, to be totally normal? Yeah, I mean, um, it depend the, the main factor main factor that would determine how much the person can recover from it would be at what age um, the one hemisphere is damaged. The earlier in infancy it's damaged, the more able they are to recover. And that's what happened in the, the video, the example that I, that I gave. Um, it was done in fairly young age. Um, she was an infant still, I think under four years old, something like that. Um, so her brain was able to recover um, most of the functions. Next up is Monica. Vanessa and Kevin. Monica? Um, hi, good evening. Uh, my question is, what happens to the brain of people who suffer from starving? And does the brain somehow get adapted to the situation? Um, so I think you said starving? Yeah. Like, uh, starving, yes. Okay. Yes, starving, yeah. So 
Yeah, I mean, so it depends on, I mean, the most impact would be in childhood because the, so two things. One, one the brain needs energy to grow, okay? And that occurs until about age 25. So if there's a, a, a significant deficit of energy, that's what food basically does. Food gives us energy and nutrients. This is a significant deficit in the earliest years of life. For example, in infancy, it would have devastating consequences because the child's brain would literally not grow as well as, as it needs to. It would not have the energy. And the growth of the brain follows DNA, but also follows a time sequence. The, the DNA encodes a time sequence, meaning that it's 25 years. So if for the first five years, child is on a very calorie-restricted calorie diet, for example, right? It, you know, for example, let's say the parent thinks that, oh, I don't want a fat baby, so I'm going to not give them any calories or very, very low calories. We're actually harming the baby because the brain needs a lot of calories. It needs a lot of fat to develop. And so if you don't give calories to the baby for the first five years, their brain actually will not grow and it will not be able to catch up with that because those five years will never come back. It'll, in, after the five years, it'll grow on other areas. So it's, it's very important. It depends on, on what time period we're talking about. Thank you. Uh, next up is Vanessa. Vanessa, what's your question? Okay, I guess this would, what would happen if there was like a system overload? Which sector would have priority like in managing the crisis? Let's say extreme mental fatigue, where either you're trying too much at one time, like trying to handle a calculus or complex physics formula, we're also, let's say, trying to sing an aria in uh, your non-native tongue. Um, that? Oh. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, so this, this, the question has to do with um, parallelism and redundancy. So th this is one of the reasons why our brain developed the way it did, um, because it allows us to do more when parts of our brain aren't working, or um, another way to look at it is that, um, you know, the, the lower order brains that we grow um, are less capable, and the higher order brains that we grow are more capable. But each of those brains, or most of those brains, are able to do the same things more or less. So our paleomimilian brain can actually do a lot of what our cortex can do. Um, and so there is conflict. So when you talk about brain overload, this actually happens, does happen, it can happen. When the brain overloads, it's because multiple parts of the brain are trying to do the same, trying to work on the same thing. And that's, for example, when you would have conflict. So the examples that I gave, I didn't go further into it yet, but when you have conflict between brain regions, that would be an example where different parts of the brain are trying to do, this, to do the same thing. And you have to remember that these brain regions don't normally talk to each other. That, that happens later as we grow after uh, early childhood. Our brain actually, parts of our brain actually learn to sense what's going on in other parts of our brain. But at the beginning and the earliest years of childhood, our baby's brain isn't aware of all of the things that's happening you know, throughout its brain. So if there's distrust in an infant, it's actually more difficult for it to, to resolve. That's the reason why it needs its parent. All right, we'll take one last question from Kevin and then we will continue. Kevin and Cotton, and then we will continue on. Kevin. Yes, thank you, Sanjay. Great talk. Um, uh, my question is, uh, when do conscious mind and uh, cognition evolve in human babies on based on that stage? So thank you. Um, well, the quick answer is we don't know. Um, we're not going to know for, for many, many years because that's an area of, of research that's going on. It's been going on for a long time and it's, it's very complicated. Um, a more nuanced answer is that some parts of it we do understand. And, um, you know, a baby, so, I mean, again, if, if you look at the previous discussion that I did, the introduction to consciousness, that goes into some of this. I won't go too much into this because that, that video, that talk, we, we went into a lot of the initial aspects. But uh, roughly speaking, a for a baby, um, there's very little consciousness that develops early on, but they do have some level of consciousness. But, but the consciousness they have is more geared around physical consciousness. Wonderful. Uh, last question is by Cotton. Cotton, go ahead. 
Yes, hi, good evening. Thank you so much for this uh, conversation. It's so interesting. I had a question regarding, um, so many people say that we don't use our entire brain, like we only use 10% of our brain. And if we were able to use it fully, we would be able to do things that are not humanly possible. Is this true? Or um, how, why is it that we're not using our full brain in its full capacity to like be able to do things like, for instance, if there's like, extreme cold temperatures, we will not be bothered by it because it's just in the brain, in the mind. Thank you. Yeah, um, so this, this, uh, uh, you know, this way of describing our brain that, that we only use 10% of it or a small percentage of it is it's both accurate and inaccurate. So it's accurate in the sense that if you th think of all of the neurons that we have, the 86 billion neurons that, that a normal adult has in the human has in their brain, we're using very, very few of those at any given time. Okay. Out of the, so if you want to think of 10%, out of the 86 billion, we're only using around 8 to 9 billion of those neurons at, at any given moment. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is that it's not true that we're all, we always have 8 to 9 billion neurons on at the same time. Okay. Sometimes we have more. Sometimes we have much less. Um, our brain is a dynamic organ. It, it does a lot of different things. So depending on the situation, we may have more neurons active or less neurons active. Um, also, it's pretty much impossible for us. To, there's a certain threshold of neurons, of neuronal activity. That's, for example, of the 86 billion neurons, let's say that, that above 30 billion, if we started to use more than 30 billion of those neurons simultaneously, we would probably start to experience things that are, that are akin to like epilepsy, right? It's too much activity, and the activity is, cannot be differentiated. So there's a limit to how much, how many of those neurons we can actually use. But that's something important to understand. That's the reason why it's not possible for us to use 100% of the neurons, let's say, in our, in our brain. There's another way to look at this is not number of neurons, but the number of connections between neurons. I won't go into that now, but that's a more sophisticated way to look at it. Excellent. Uh, so Sanjay, shall we uh, move on to the next part of the presentation? Yeah. Let me get the, uh, the slide. I don't know if, uh, hopefully this is visible. Yeah, it's good. Okay. So, um, so we talked about the uh, multi-system uh, uh, condition of the brain. And next we'll talk about uh, complex behavior. So first we'll start with a very simple definition of what is complex behavior, right? So. In a, in the simplest way to describe it is a complex behavior is an action where the reasons behind the action are difficult to see. Okay. So what's key here is that we have reasons that cause the behavior and there's an action involved. These are the important words. So reasons is plural. Okay. There are multiple reasons. That's significant. Okay. Um, and also one, one of the reasons is that there are multiple simultaneous emotions or thoughts that can arise inside the brain. Um, and so right now, I won't go into the multiple reasons. This is just one of those multiple reasons. We'll go into more of those in the next slide. But for now, just remember that there are many reasons. And the most important of those reasons is that we have multiple simultaneous thoughts and emotions. Okay? Um, also, the concept is that these uh, reasons are difficult to see. Okay? That's fairly important. So we're going to add some schemas around our definition. We're going to make it a little more complex, complicated definition. So. We're unaware of our own multiple emotions. Okay, this is true. Most of the time, we are not um, able to sense all of the different emotions or thoughts or feelings that we have inside of our mind. Um, now, if we try to think about it, we can. But when you walk going through daily life, doing whatever you need to, um, you're typically not aware of more than one or two or at most three emotions that uh, you may be feeling simultaneously. But we have many more than that. And once you think of it, when we realize that the brain has multiple subsystems, each of those subsystems can have one or more emotions or thoughts in it. So in a sense, if we think of the brain as, as being composed of 14 systems, 14 subsystems, right? Then you can have at a minimum 14 uh, thoughts or emotions. Actually, it's not that because some of those subsystems are, don't have thinking involved, like the brain stem doesn't really do any thinking. But in general, you know, around eight to 10 thoughts 
is probably something that you know, we can have very easily, even though we would not be aware of most of those. Another aspect is that many of these emotions that we're unaware of, they're internalized and they're hidden, but they're also habitual. Okay? They're habitual internalized emotions about ourselves. So for example, as we grow up, the many things that we learn about ourselves, either positive things or negative things. Okay? So we may learn that we are um, you know, capable, we, 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 we have a, a, you know, a very beautiful singing voice. Our parents or our siblings or, or, or teachers you know, taught us that. So we have this sense that our, we have a singing voice and it's very beautiful or it's very good. Okay? Or we may, you know, as if, you're, if you're growing up, a parent may keep telling us, oh, stop doing that. Or, you know, why do you keep doing that? Or, you know, you know you're eating too much. Anything, you know, anything that, that other people keep repeating, these types of thoughts will become internalized inside of our mind. Um, and they will become habitual. So these are all things that are also hidden and they're inside of our mind. Um, then we also learn through life, through acting. We, we learn unspoken, unwritten rules, social rules um, that you know, happen. Uh, you know, they don't necessarily, um, we don't learn it in the formal sense, but, but they, we learn them through daily activity. And then also there are other rules that we learn that are taboo rules, let's say. Or we may, we may learn that sometimes we may need to break rules. For example, in, in the, right up to the discussion, I give an example of war, right? So there's a taboo in society, in, in, in every society, that you cannot kill people. Killing another person is wrong. But at times of war, soldiers are taught and expected to break that taboo. They're expected to kill the enemy. They're expected to redefine the mental framework to allow them to do this thing that's taboo. Not only that, in times of war, there's another taboo, which, you know, that we were only, even in times of war, we have rules defined. They're, they're, these rules, we have special rules for warfare, but some people, even in warfare, break those taboos. So even within war, even within wartime, you have taboos that are okay to break and that you're expected to break, and there are other taboos that you're expected not to break. For example, genocide or or using rape as a weapon. These are, these are taboos at times of war that nobody's supposed to use, but sometimes people have used. So, you know, all of these things, when we think about behavior and, and reasons and, and multiple emotions, it can really get very, very complicated. So one of the things that with all of these different behaviors that we have, they all basically emerge into action. So at the end, you know, when we talk about a simple definition of a complex behavior, at the end of it, there has to be some type of action that, that arises out of the complex behavior. Okay. So I'm going to, to summarize just briefly about what is a complex behavior. The complex behavior has multiple simultaneous thoughts and emotions in one or multiple brain regions, brain subsystems, um, and some of them may be hidden to us. Oftentimes, a lot of them are hidden from us. And usually, there will be conflict between some of these simultaneous thoughts and emotions. And this conflict requires resolution, right? because re conflict creates stress in us. And stress is never a good thing. We want to resolve stress. So there's resolution that's required. Um, and as part of the resolution process, the self-regulating process, um, it may cause other emotions to arise. And it may also cause an action to occur or an enervation to occur. Enervation is when. Um, a nerve is, is basically subdued, it, the impulses are subdued. So for example, you know, if you have an emotion that arises, one of the things that may happen after resolution is that it may cause an action. An action may be that signal is sent from uh, that region of the brain where that, uh, you know, those thoughts happen. It goes through a certain nerve to muscles and the muscles cause you to smile, okay? So that's an action. You had the thought and the thought caused you to move muscles, which cause a smile. That's complex behavior, that you may have had multiple thoughts, multiple emotions and thoughts, they resolved itself, and then at the end, you, ha you had a resolution which caused you to smile. Um, now, sometimes what actually happens is that the additional emotions that arise or the enervation of, a, of an impulse that arises, that, can ha that happens, can actually cause this entire cycle to repeat. It can initiate another complex behavior or more than one complex behavior. 
So this is what makes complex behavior so difficult to, to fathom. This is what makes the field of psychology um, so difficult um, and psychiatry for that matter is so difficult is that complex behaviors cause other complex behaviors to happen. This happens all of the time. And so to really understand anything, you have to try to break it down into the simplest complex behavior and, and, and look at the cascade that may happen. So this is something that, that happens where, you know, it, it causes one complex behavior after it completes can cause a second complex or third or fourth complex behavior to, to recreate. And this can become a loop. And if it happens enough, you can actually get into a panic situation. And that's an example of a panic where, you know, you have so many complex behaviors happening all at once in a very finite amount of time within a few seconds, and that can cause panic in a person. So that's, that's you know, a simple definition of panic is when you have so many complex behaviors that don't get resolved or the, the resolution causes other behaviors to rise and it causes this cascade cycling. Right? So now we'll describe some examples. Some really simple, we'll start with some simple examples of complex behaviors. So one of the examples is of a child that's jumping rope. Okay? And what I've done here is, is I have this table, this uh, chart that I have, I've split into 14 subsystems. Okay? So um, it, originally when we talked about uh, the three subsystems, the rightmost three are the one subsystem, this is the brainstem. And then we have the limbic system here in the middle, which is the, uh, the pallium mammalian cortex. It, is kind of similar to the limbic system. That, that's easier for people to understand, so I'd use that term here. And then the left four on, on the left side are actually the, um, this is the cortex. And if you remember, the cortex has four lobes, and each lobe has a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere, so that makes up eight segments. So if you look at all of these together, form 14 subsystems. So in one sense, you know, if you want to think of it, I mean, we can go beyond, birth further beyond, but this is probably the level of complexity that is beyond, you know, we don't want to go much further than this, but, you know, I've, I've subdividing the brain into 14 subsystems. Um, so in these 14 subsystems, I've described what would happen when a child is skipping, playing with a jump rope. So because they're jumping, there's physical activity involved, the medulla oblongata is involved, and that's, remember, that's involved in or survival and, and body control. So it has activated, elevated the heart rate and respiratory rate. It would have uh, caused, and because the child is, is jumping rope and act physically active, and their body therefore needs more oxygen, it needs more um, uh, energy, blood supply uh, provides energy. So the medulla oblongata would automatically do this. It would elevate the heart rate and lung. The pons would not do much. It's, it's remains at baseline, it would not be doing much. The cerebellum is the part of the brain which actually does almost all behaviors. Okay? Now it doesn't do the, the planning of behaviors. What it does do is it, it does, does the execution of the behaviors. So when you're actually doing the jump ropes, the cerebellum is what's causing your hands and your body to, to jump and your legs and everything. Cerebellum is a lot of where a lot of our muscle memory is encoded. So the cerebellum in this example would be fully activated. It's actually the most active region that's helping us to do this jump rope. Um, the limbic system is not really doing much. It's pretty much inactive at this point because when the child, there may be a little bit of activation if the child is afraid of falling. And if, they, if they're learning how to jump rope, then the limbic system may be more activated. But if they already have done this you know, for a few years and they're very good at jumping rope, then the limbic system would not be activated very much. Um, the cortex, the, the, this, this is the occipital uh, lobe, and the occipital lobe is the part that, which is used in vision. So the vision would be involved a little bit in the sense that the child would be looking, they would keep their eyes open, they would be looking to see what's happening, but they, you know, they really cannot see this rope. The rope is moving so quickly around their body. When they're jump roping, the rope moves very, very rapidly. You really can't even see it unless you pause. So the eyes are not really helping you do the jump rope at all. But the eye is actually helping with this little bit of balance, but the cerebellum also is actually doing most of the balance on its own. If you know, if you have jump rope, you may realize that even if you close your eyes, you'll be able to continue jump roping for a little bit for a few for a few skips. Um, we need our eye to coordinate beyond a few skips because our cere cerebellum can get disoriented after a few seconds. So our eye is there every few seconds to kind of keep it in sync again. So the court, so the occipital lobe is there. 
I is very used slightly to kind of maintain balance a little bit. The, um, the temporal lobe is not used very much. The, these, you know, you, I'm not going to go into much into the purpose of these of these lobes, but you know, later later discussion we'll, we may go more into those. Um, the uh, the parietal lobe is involved a little bit because that's involved in the sensory uh, stimulation of of what's happening in our body. So every time we jump, our body feels the pressure of us landing on the ground, or every time we hear the the jump ropes skip past our head, we might feel a rush of air go through. Or when our hand is holding the, the jump rope, it might feel it. So the sensations are going through. Um, this is the part of the brain that goes through. And then the cortex, um, the frontal lobe, um, the, lobe it's, the, the frontal lobe itself um, is a little bit active. It really isn't involved much in jumping rope because you don't have to do much thinking when you're jumping rope. You don't have to do much executive functions. It's, it's not doing a whole lot there. So this is just one example. So here, what we see is that basically two subsystems, two pairs of subsystems are the only ones that are, that are involved. Um, the cortex, which is all of these four on the left, is doing a little bit of um, the actual jumping, the hand, the planning of when to move, um, initiation of movement, initi you know, when, when do I turn the hand, when do I jump with the feet, um, and then the cerebellum. Cerebellum is doing most of the movement and balance. These are the two main regions of the brain that they're active in this. Everything else is kind of quizzing. Um, the cerebellum encodes movement and balance. We talked about this. And cerebellum cannot rely on vision. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't have, it has very little, it's, it's actually the other way around. The, the, the thinking brain, the, the cortex, is actually what sends signals to the cerebellum when it thinks it's important. But the cerebellum needs to know something it has no way of getting visual information. It, it, it basically developed as a blind brain because if you think of very, very low order, like insects, um, their visual system is very underdeveloped and their cerebellum, which helps them to move, like that's why you know a lot of insects can, can move very in sophisticated ways um, without actually having to, to see things. They, they actually sense in other ways. Their, uh, their proprioception, which is, um, part of our uh, peripheral nervous system, which helps us to understand the orientation of our body in space and around the things around us, is actually what the cerebellum is good at. So it relies on a lot of that. Um, actions are occurring when you're jumping rope, actions are occurring too quickly. So the cortex, the limbic system are really not getting too much information. The information is happening too quickly. So they're kind of not doing a whole lot there. Um, so the cortex is used only, in this example, it's used only the kind of time when we move our hands, you know, rhythmic motion of the, of the jump rope and rhythmic motion of our feet up and down. It's very little um, that we have to do. There's no cognition involved. You know, mo most of this is automatic muscle memory that causes us to do jump roping. And, you know, what you described is I could do that with my eyes closed. You know, many people actually can jump rope with their eyes closed. That's the reason why, because a lot of more advanced parts of our brain aren't even needed. Um, so th this, is, this is a complex behavior, but this is a pretty simple type of complex behavior. There's another type of complex behavior that we'll, I'll describe, the next one. And this is where a child is sleeping, initially they're dreaming, and then they have a nightmare. Okay. Um, so in the beginning when they're, when they're sleeping, so here I'm going to describe two states. The first state is dreaming. So when they're first dreaming, their medulla is at baseline, it's not doing a whole lot because um, one of the things is that the pons has actually paralyzed the body. When we're sleeping, especially when we're dreaming, our body intentionally is paralyzed. Our brain paralyzes our body because it doesn't want us, like when our brain is active, when the rest of our brain is active, it can cause our body to twitch and move. Like if we're think, dreaming of motion, if we're dreaming of walking, our muscles will actually begin to walk. And through evolution, we've learned that that's not a good thing. So our brain has learned to paralyze itself to paralyze our body when we're dreaming. So the pons is the part of the brain that primarily does that. So it's caused paralysis. And that's one of the reasons why our medulla oblongata is not doing a whole lot. It's basically at baseline meaning it's just keeping us alive and you know, normal respiration, normal uh, you know, heart rate, all the rhythms, normal digestive uh, rate, everything is very normal. But the other regions of the brain, the limbic system and the, the eight regions of the cortex, what they're doing is kind of random. There's random activation of things. And this is kind of what you know, we believe dreaming to be. Now, we're not 100% sure of this, but 
this is probably you know what what it is. So all of these ten parts of the brain are actually um, randomly having. You might think of you know the whatever happened during your day because you know, you're sleeping at night. So do whatever happened in the past few hours, they will activate and you they will kind of replay some of those things. Also, what they're doing is, um, so 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 you know, actually, me. So, so the uh, there is a lot of um, random thoughts and emotions that are occurring in those parts of the brain. The cerebellum is inactive because it's been paralyzed. If the body's paralyzed, so the cerebellum, even if it does anything, it wouldn't be able to do much because you know, and it, there's no need because the other parts of our brain are. Uh, uh, are kind of randomly working on their own. Also during sleeping, what, what some of the things that happen are that our brain, what we believe is happening is that our brain is kind of clearing up some of the residual emotions and thoughts from the day. It's also kind of clear, clearing up various processes within the brain. And it's also reinforcing various memories that we have. So in a sense, it's kind of recording the things that are important for us in the day. So during dreaming, let's say that, that we have, one of the things that happens is that in the occipital lobe, which is the part of our brain that, that sees vision. Now, we might see a scary uh, vision, right? You know, we're not really seeing it because our eyes are closed, but that part of our brain would have this sensation of, of seeing something. But let's say that it sees something that appears to be scary, and let's say it's only one in one half of the, of the occipital lobe and not in both, because you know, they're, they're independent. It doesn't have to happen in both. So one of those gets scared, and if, so one of the things to understand is that, um, and, and this bottom bullet that I have here is that, um, and I'm kind of giving a little bit of an explanation that this example is specifically a child dreaming. But, so if it's an older child and it sees something scary while it's dreaming, it might be able to resolve it because the other parts of its brain, because if it's an older child, it's already learned how to regulate its brain on its own. And an adult definitely has learned that, you know, what, this is the reason why when an adult um, gets a nightmare, typically it doesn't impact them as much as, as children. So if this is a young child and they see a scary vision um, in their mind um, and they have not learned how to regulate it, they will have a lot more distress and that scary vision will extract, it will cause other things to happen in the brain. But if it's an older child or if it's an adult, what happens is this last bullet describes this is that they may try to self-regulate that image and kind of you know, quash it. It's kind of like subdue the idea of that image or to take away the power of that image, right? And adults have already learned this. So what happens is that um, this is the reason why adults are less affected by, by nightmares, by tip, normal nightmares, you know? And this is a typical adult. In some cases, if you have trauma, let's say that as a child, you were bitten by a dog viciously. Let's say that, you know, that happened to you. Well, anytime you have, you have that, even as an adult, if you have an image of a dog, it's probably going to cause you know, a lot of fear in you. So that, type, that adult would not be able to remove the fear of, of dogs for most of their life because they, they had this extreme event happen in their life. But if, if that adult has other visions while they're dreaming, they would be able to uh, modulate that fairly effectively. So again, not every adult can do it. It depends on what happened in your, in your, in your past. So let's say that this, this child has a scary thought. Very quickly, it's going to pass into the limbic system. And the limbic system is going to, because one of the things that I didn't mention is that all, all of these parts of our brain are connected to their neighboring parts of the brain. Okay? The, the, and, and information in one part of the brain very rapidly moves to the neighboring parts of the brain because the integration between the neighboring parts are very, very strong. Now, over time, the information can pass on to other further parts of the brain, but it has to pass through intermediate stages. So in this case, the occipital lobe is actually very close to the limbic parts of the limbic system. So very rapidly that, that fearful image would appear. It would go into the limbic system. And in this case, remember, this is on the same side of the brain. This is not crossing to the other side. And the limbic system gets activated. And at the bottom, we're showing that you know, if the fear is unregulated, that child would have panic. And they're still sleeping. Remember, they're still sleeping. But what may happen is that they may that panic would cause an immediate change in their brain state, okay? that their limbic system, both parts of their limbic system, the left and right hemispheres, would go into this alert state, okay? which would cause the medulla oblongata 
to go into a heightened state, it would cause our blood pressure to rise. It would cause our heart rate to rise. This is what happens when you have a nightmare. It would cause our body to start sweating. Okay? Um, and as soon as, and this may happen within a few seconds, and as soon as this happens, it may cause some signals for cerebellum, cause our body to jump up out of bed abruptly. And the activity that happens over a few you know, seconds, our frontal lobe will be alerted to this and it'll go on higher alert. It all of a sudden, it, it, it will realize, and remember, all of these parts of the brain were dreaming just a, a few seconds ago. And they were kind of dreaming about random things and whatever, maybe happy things. And all of a sudden, the frontal lobe, which is also, you know, it's believed this is where consciousness resides, becomes highly alert. And we're alert and conscious and awake, right? The nightmare awoke us. So this is just an example of, you know, a fairly complex interaction of things that can happen in our brain. Uh, when we are dreaming and then we have this nightmare occur. Um, and in an adult, the frontal lobe, even after you have the nightmare, it may try to soothe you so that you can go back to sleep. So th this soothing aspect is a very important aspect of our brain. Okay. Um, actually, I think this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip, I think th th this I, I wanted to talk about, but th that's going to take a little more time. I, I, so let's, uh, let's start looking at two conceptual models for the brain and then for a complex behavior. Okay. Um, so the first model is of the brain. And so, so far we've talked about the brain as a system of parallel simultaneous subsystems. Um, and here we talked about 14 subsystems. And the first bold bullet I described is that this model we can think of as, as the brain having 14 subsystems, but it works the same way if you think of the brain as having three or five or eight or 14 or any number. It actually, it works just as well if you think of the brain as having simply two subsystems. And I'm going to describe here. So there are alternate versions of the brain that you can think of. Here I've described, I've numbered these subsystems. Um, this from the right, the rightmost side is the most primitive part of our brain. So that's where it starts. So this is one version of, of uh, this model where you can have eight uh, subsystems where the, Medulla, so the rightmost three are the brainstem. Limbic system, the left and right um, have uh, you know, a left and right hemisphere. And then the cortex is divided just into left half and right half. So these four subregions of the cortexes are not different. They, they're all considered to be one. So that's one version of, of, of model of the brain. Another model of the brain can be where we, we don't even look at any left and right hemispheres. But this is a much simpler version where we do the oblongata is one, the pons is one, the cerebellum doesn't have left and right, the limbic system doesn't have left and right, but the cortex is divided into four different regions, the four lobes, and the two hemisphere lobes work together. So this is another version of eight. So with eight, there actually is, are two versions that we can have. Um, another version of, of this model is where you can have five subsystems, where we do the oblongata, the pons, and the cerebellum work, you know, these are the three, the limbic system is one, and the cortex is a fifth. Now, if you remember early on when we talked about the five regions of the brain when it's developing in from the, the uh, uh, from the notochord, um, this is actually that system, that that version of the brain. That these are the five uh, parts of the brain that that develop initially, uh, and then the most simple part of the brain is where we combine the rightmost three into one subsystem. Okay. And then the limbic system is another subsystem, and the entire cortex is a third subsystem. I've numbered it that here is zero, one, and two for a reason. Okay. All of the other ones were numbered from one onward. I re numbered it zero, one, and two because some of you may be familiar with Daniel Kahneman, uh, his book, um, Thinking Fast and uh, so the you know, System One, System Two. And in his, in his model, he basically has described the brain as two systems system one and system two. And it's not that he came up with the system. This, this theory actually has been around since the 19, early 1960s. It's called the triune model of the brain, three models of the three, uh, th three cell system model of the brain. He basically took that and took the two main parts of it, the limbic system and the cortex. And he gave those terminology, system one and system two, and he wrote a book around that. So, um, and, and believe it or not, there is a system zero underneath it, which is not a thinking part. It doesn't have any thinking. So that's the reason why in his book, it didn't have any. 
relevance. So going back to, to 14, this model, it's, it's important to understand that the grain, that different parts of the brain grow and mature at different times and different rates. That's important in this model. Also, the subsystems interact with each other. They can cooperate, they can conflict, or they can get into imbalance. And the imbalance can be temporary or they can be long-term. And, and the imbalance can be due to a disease or disorder. Um, for example, you know, there may be different, you know, many types of mental illnesses that are usually caused by imbalances in different regions of the brain. So that would be an example where there's a long-term imbalance or a permanent imbalance in one part of the brain or one or more parts of the brain. But still, the person would still have their, all of these subregions of the brain, subsystems of the brain, but some of these subsystems would be working in a either diminished or alternate way, and it may cause more conflict with other parts of the brain. So this may be one way of looking at mental illness as a, an imbalance that is physically present in the brain, or there actually are, are um, mental illnesses where it is not congenital. It actually develops after birth. Um, but basically, if there's an imbalance in one, one or more parts of the brain, that imbalance causes disruption, dis, uh, you know, abnormal behavior, which causes additional conflict from other parts of the brain. Um, in the model, the cortex most is, is the main part of the brain which tries to assuage you, it tries to calm and self-regulate all of the other subsystems of the brain. Um, th so this is an aspect of homeostasis. Homeostasis, we described earlier, is very important in all biological systems. And in the brain, it's, it's also just as important. Um, so it, when, when there's no down-regulating or when there's no um, down-regulating me down -regulating memories that exist um, for, for a situation, uh, then uh, the brain will usually stabilize and heal itself. So, you know, in green, what this means is, you know, when, when you're in a garden, when you're in an in almost idyllic Ed Edenic situation, um, over time, the brain will heal itself. Okay? Time heals all wounds. So this self-regulatory aspect of this, the, the search for homeostasis and equilibrium is actually a self-healing aspect of the brain also. That it's trying to heal itself in a way. It's not really healing, it's trying to, to calm itself down. But when there's a lot of activity, when there's a lot of disruption and a lot of conflict, that um, is in a sense doing the same thing as what healing is doing. So this homeostatic uh, um, aspect of the brain is, is very beneficial to us. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we learn to do it um, in childhood, is that it really helps us in adulthood. So that, um, Actually, that, that, that was the, um, the brain. So this is the next model is the model of complex behavior, right? So complex behaviors have a, they begin from a stimulus and they end with an output or an innervation. Okay? That's important, there's a beginning and end. Complex Sanjay, behavior I just want to check up, uh, Sanjay, I just want to check up on time. Uh, how is it uh, going in terms of how much more of the presentation is left? Um, we're actually close to the end. I'm just about to finish. I oh, this. perfect. Last perfect. One, then we can break. Take your time. We, we can break or we can do Q&A. So, um, uh, so just another minute or two and then we'll, we'll be able to do Q&A. So complex behaviors, when they, they occur in everyone. This is very, very normal. Um, as we speak, okay, each, each one of you, and including myself, we have multiple thoughts and emotions in our mind that are vying for, for importance, that are vying for position, that are there. They're competing with other thoughts and emotions. And only some of those actually rise to the level where they actually cause some type of output. And other ones that don't cause an output, they get enervated. They kind of get subdued. They get pushed down. And this is one of the things that, that is complex about our behavior is that when some of those thoughts and emotions get pushed down into our subconscious again, they remain repressed. And if, if, you, know, if you have some type of aspect of your personality which keeps pushing down some of those thoughts and emotions, those thoughts and emotions want to come out, right? And they never get a chance to come out. They, they keep getting pushed down. So that's, that's an example where, um, you know, there will be um, problems with, uh, uh, you know, long-term behavior because uh, things that our brain wants to do or thoughts and emotions that, that our brain has, which are trying to find a way out, never get a way out. So, these are all normal things. They are, these are not caused by disorders or, or diseases. This is all normal thing, things that, that happen in the brain. So 
Again, complex behaviors happen because we have many subsystems, and each of these subsystems can have simultaneously um, subconscious thoughts and, and emotions within them. Um, now, complex behaviors have distinct steps. Okay? We talked about the beginning and the output, but they actually have five distinct steps. There's an initiation, there's a conflict, there's a resolution, there's an output um, of something happening, and then optionally, they can be cascade where they cause another complex behavior to occur. Um, and uh, just quickly, this is the last part of this. So initiation basically means um, there's an extra, either an external stimuli, something that happened from outside, we heard something that caused something to, to um, the previous emotion, or an internal memory gets activated. Usually an internal memory is activated from external stimuli. Rarely is, so usually external stimuli is what causes initiation. Um, but you know, rarely, in very, very rare cases, it can just be a memory, a deep uh, running memory that, that activates uh, conflicts. Conflicts can, so I'm not going to go a lot of detail into this because this is actually very difficult to explain right now. But conflicts are basically, so thoughts and emotions are electrical activity. They're electrical charges in our brain, in, in a region, in a, in a spatial region of our brain. And so these electrical charges are competing in one sense. And they're competing for resolution. They're competing for resolution. I mean, these mental energy are trying to find a path to release themselves, um, which means they're trying to find another, they're trying to get to another part of our brain, which can allow a muscle to activate or to, um, or to, to allow storing a memory um, into part of our brain. So conflict, and so then, and then you would need to have a resolution. The resolution is where another part of our brain, usually in the prefrontal cortex and part of our, our, our uh, frontal lobe, various parts of our frontal lobe, um, they act together to regulate and kind of quash down and, and either release or dispense or disperse the mental energy from some of those conflicting uh, thoughts and emotions. And then uh, if there's anything left, then there can be an output. An output can be either a muscle happening. For example, I described a smile forming. It can be that you move your arm. It can be that you sneeze. You know, anything can happen as an output. Or it can be that a memory gets stored back in. And in very complex situations, you can actually have a cascading of events where the energy that's left over can cause one or more other um, complex behaviors to arise. Right. So let's stop here. Oh, just a second. I need to unmute everybody. All right, Joe, sorry about that. Go ahead. Oh, no problem. Um, you know, I'll just keep it quick. Uh, it was a great presentation, Sanjay. There's a lot of information. Uh, the one question that I have really quickly is you brought up the idea of a complex uh, complexity uh, behavior with dreaming. And I was wondering if you knew or could even speculate on what had happened with the videos that were posted with the individual that had either the two hemispheres severed or the half brain removed. You know, where are they capable of dreaming? And what is the impact of that if they're not? Um. Well, I mean, my, my understanding of dreaming is, is you know, the way I explained it here, that, that there are random processes, there are random um, uh, impulses that arise within the brain um, while, while we're sleeping, while we're dreaming, certain phases of sleep. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, go ahead. Okay. So, um, and and um, so if a person has a, 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 I forget what the term is, that's basically where the hemispheres are, are, are separated, um, uh, I guess the corpus, corpus callosus to me. Um, if they're separated, the two hemispheres are still functioning on their own. They're just not connecting with each other. So they would be able to dream in the same way, except, um, I mean, it's really speculation what, what would happen because uh, normal, in a normal person's brain, probably the hemispheres, because they're communicating, the dreams between the two hemispheres also would be somewhat linked. And a person who has two separate hemispheres that are not linked, they may actually have different dreams. They may probably they may be able to have different dreams in each of their hemispheres, but they would not be aware of that. This is one of the things that that in that video, um, one of the videos that we, we saw, um, if you remember, there was a scene where the woman, um, her right hand, 
she was in her closet in the, in the morning. She was look, trying to pick up clothes to wear. And her right hand picked up one cloth with certain patterns and coloring. And her left hand picked up a different clothing. And she got upset because she didn't like the clothing that her left hand picked up. So the same thing, the, the two hemispheres aren't connecting. They're not communicating. And they both have their own view of the world. And they both make their own decisions and choices. So similarly, probably in dreaming, they would have different, possibly different dreams. Next up is uh, Mike, Dave, Claudio, Vanessa, Monica, and Mushki. Mike, I'll give you two minutes. Two minutes. I only need 20 seconds this time. Perfect. Uh, as you were describing the girl jumping rope, it brought to mind the feedback loops, both positive and negative, of the OODA loop. And uh, we tried to define something called a transfer function. Now, each of the different, uh, different uh, portions fit together. Do you, uh, you've seen some of those OODA loop discussions. Do you see application there as a notation? Yeah, I mean, the OODA loop is, is, is a simplified version of, of this also. I mean, basically what we're talking, when we're talking about complex behaviors and, and a multi-tiered uh, multi model of the brain, it, it's, it, it, the OODA loop applies here very strongly. Um, I'm not going to go into finding the parallels between them, but, but it's, yeah, they're, they're very, uh, uh, very similar aspects of it. Uh, next up is Dave followed by Claudio. Dave? Uh, sorry, pushing the wrong button there. Uh, thanks for the presenta presentation, Sanjay. In our small group, we were talking about uh, the videos on the Meetup page, uh, the uh, you know the cable between the two brains, and the young lady who had, had half her brain removed at a very young age, and would made an amazing recovery. And the thing about procrastination. So if you're planning another Meetup in the near future. Uh, I'm, I know I'm guilty of procrastination. I was here following some of that, but I think uh, some of that could be explored more in the rewiring. Uh, very interesting things. Uh, the brain is just an amazing uh, uh, part of our body. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, you know, we're, we're going to continue. I mean, a lot of the ideas that I raise in, in each, uh, each uh, video, in each session, um, we build further on those in later sessions, because all of this is, it's, it's not like, you know, you've learned everything there is about, about the, uh, the multi-tiered model of the brain. I mean, there's much more that can be learned. These, these are just bite-sized, I mean, they're a little larger than bite-sized nuggets. They're pretty substantial, but because there's so much information here. But yeah, we'll continue. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Next up is going to be Claudio. Claudio, go ahead. Yes, hello. Hi, uh, Sanjay. Uh you mentioned earlier about the 25 years it takes complexity to develop and it kind of like follows an evolutionary sequence. I'm wondering, uh, beginning from the embryological process to then from uh, infancy to adulthood, it's, it, it, presuming, assuming that's the uh, evolution fast forward, which part of the biological system, uh, for, for instance, DNA, plays the most prominent role and uh, makes that possible? Uh, what is it that actually uh, enable enables that i'm not following which i mean which part of the dna you're asking no no which part of the biological system is it in the brain somewhere else is it the dna that, that plays the most prominent role in the fast forward evolution of human development from the fetus all the way to the adulthood because it's it, like you mentioned it follows an evolutionary sequence are you referring to complexity but i mean the, the overall the overall development I'm referring to of the uh, of the human, right? So, so that's actually encoded within the DNA. So, so one of the things to understand is that, and this is a totally different topic. I won't go too much into it, but when DNA is is uh, is transcribed and used to uh, replicate, it's transcribed in regions, uh, co uh, codons and regions and genes, and those genes are also transcribed in a kind of a sequence. So the sequencing that happens um, is encoded in the DNA itself. So the DNA has within it, like there was a, there was a line that I mentioned in it, is the DNA itself encodes how to build a brain. Right? And not only how to build a brain, but the sequence in which to build a brain is encoded within the DNA. So DNA encodes all of that information. It's very difficult for me to explain it in, in briefly, but 
I don't know if, because that's a whole different topic, um, whether we're going to be able to do that in, in the series. Wonderful. Next up is Vanessa followed by Monica. Vanessa. Sanjay, thanks for the presentation. Um, I wonder if this is an elementary basic comparison, uh, like if you compare it to SEPTA, the transportation system, if you're at City Hall, where you can maybe have four modes of transportation and you're deciding which one to take, or you got the more simple, the Broad Street line never goes above ground. You got the Market Frankfurt line that's elevated in subway and the trolleys. And the one thing maybe, I guess the most complex is you could go from the subway to the trolley to a bus. Is that kind of a similar comparison or is that completely way off? Um, no, you, you can't think of it that way. Um, you can think of it as, as uh, communication paths between all of the different levels. Um, but uh, I'm trying to think of if that analogy completely, I mean, the analogy to some extent does fit, but it probably will not because the brain is a dynamic system, whereas um, most metro systems are not dynamic. They don't change over time or not, not rapidly. It's very hard to, to dig underground and, and expand. But with the brain, it's dynamic. So to some extent, it applies. Thank you. Next up is Monica, followed by Mushki. Uh, Monica. Good evening, Sanjay. Thanks for the presentation. I'd like to bring an example to check if it would be an example of complex behavior. Uh, a boy at school who suffers uh, a bullying attack, and then he has a physical uh, reaction like blushing and urinating in his pants. And then he reacts shouting, uh, talking in loud voice with his colleagues. Would this be a, a, an example of a complex behavior? Um, those would be multiple complex behaviors because each complex behavior has an action right, or, or, or a result. So oh, probably that that's, I mean, so bullying, so if you take the, the simple act of bullying or the, the most uh, minute part of bullying is where somebody is confronted, they, they, they have uh, conflicting emotions put into them where, for example, let's say a bully comes up to you and you, if you're a student, you're a child in school and the bully says, give me your, your money, right? Well, you have the options you have are either you in your, in your mind, in the child's mind, um, they would have the feeling of either fighting the bully or um, fleeing, you know, running from the bully or submitting to the bully, right? Those are three options that are available to the child, either, either giving them the money or fighting with that bully or running away from the bully. And then the child would have to make a decision on what to do. So that would be the simplest level of, of a behavior in that situation. And then once they do that, it may get more complicated because if they fight, and the fight would create more complex behaviors, or if they run, et cetera, or if they flee, they may feel guilt from fleeing, right? Or no, if, if, if they give the money to the bully, they may feel guilt from that. So, you know, e each, each complex behavior can have multiple other um, ensuing behaviors. Uh, Mushki asks, how can we use our conscious mind to affect our subconscious mind? to affect our subconscious mind. Well, yeah, like we discussed in the breakout room, but besides visualization, which is I discussed cybernetics and visualization, but what else can we, what do you have in mind for that answer? Right, right. Thank so, you. I mean, the subconscious mind is not something that we can easily um, consciously change because, well, by one, it's, we don't know what's in the subconscious or we have very, very little understanding. Each, what I mean by we is the person themselves, right? And only if you understand exactly, I mean, and, and you can gain some level of understanding in that. Um, there are many techniques that you know, uh, psychology uses. If you gain an understanding of your own subconscious to some extent, you may be able to, but that's extremely difficult to do. It's only as well as, and, and also when you think that you understand your subconscious, in fact, it may only be a guess. So if you think you understand it, you have a false understanding, and you take action on the false understanding, you may actually end up causing more problems than not. So it's, it's very challenging. It's a very challenging set of behaviors. Next up is going to be Jyoti followed by Judith. Jyoti. Yes, yeah, Sanjay. I, I, I see some people walking very confused. What is happening in their mind? What is happening in their brain? 
they look very confused they are, you know they're smart intelligent people but they're like oh okay all right okay so it's like they are trying to put their thoughts in on some kind of organized fashion but why is there a confusion are you talking about just in general when people are walking and they're thinking about something at the same time no i i used to work with a couple of people and they were always i didn't know what to expect from them they were very confused and i had to help them you know organize their thoughts uh, it was causing a lot of problem working with them and everybody said that that you know what's going on that's that's a complex behavior <laughs> what's happening in their brain um yeah i mean there's there's no way for me to know because it, it because complex behaviors you have to get into the root of each of those behaviors what's yeah, you have to basically like similar to what what I did in in, in this talk. I, I tried to do diagramming, but even the diagramming you have to do it at a at a level where you look at individual uh, in the, the most individual behaviors. Like most most complex behavior are cascades of behaviors. There there are multiple behaviors that happen either simultaneously or they happen rapidly one after the other. And a lot of those behaviors are subconscious. Actually, there there are many many behaviors, complex behaviors that are subconscious that never come out in outward behavior, that never come out in outward action, or they may be very subtle. You may, you may see a facial expression something. So, you know, when you were talking about that, when they were walking and, and they had confusion on their face, it may be that that confusion is, is giving you a hint at the conflict within their mind. But by looking at their face, you can't tell what the conflict is. You have to really explore with them. You have to kind of get them to open up and talk about it. The facial expression would not give you visibility into what uh, what's happening inside of them. So Sanjay, I live in New York. I see all kinds of people with all kinds of faces, with all kinds of variation of expressions. And it is it is very difficult. As it is, it is difficult enough to figure out what's going on with you uh, yourself and to kind of figure out what is going on with somebody else, the levels of what is, what the, what is possible, at, not only at the brain level, but just overall context in which it's enormously, enormously complex. Um, and Jyoti, I'm very impressed that you are awake at this point. So that I'm very impressed. Uh, next up is uh, Judith. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm uh, butting up. If it was not Sanjay, <laughs> probably I would have gone off to sleep. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thank you, Jyoti. Sorry. Judith. Hey, uh, Sanjay, in our breakout room, you gave us two questions to think about, and I think you've just pretty much um, addressed one of them, which was um, if we have conflicting emotions, um, is it possible for us to resolve it? And what I'm hearing you say with the bully story is that a conflicting emotion would be like, should I run away? Should I fight? Should I give in? Um, and then there, and then when you continued on answering Mushki, I guess, I think what you're saying is there are unconscious things that we don't understand parts of our emotions and that those would come into play in the decision that we make. So can you, so can you, am I understanding correctly? And then could you please also repeat the second question you asked us to think about and answer if you don't mind, I just don't remember, but I remember it confused me a lot. Well, um, the first question I asked um, was about consciousness, that whether um, whether consciousness is, uh, or let me say it another way, can conflicts between emotions be resolved by our consciousness? Um, that's the question I asked, and, and if so, how? Um, and the simple answer is yes, it can, but it actually is, the explanation is quite complicated. And it's not necessarily that we have to be conscious at a full level to resolve that. I mean, the question that Mushki asked that you're asking, you're focusing on the conscious aspect of that. And that's the part that's not necessary because, um, and this is something that, that uh, eventually we'll get into. I'll, I'll hopefully do a talk on this at some point, um, which will go more into consciousness. But consciousness happens at many different levels. Consciousness happens at a conscious level, but also there are aspects of consciousness which are subconscious themselves. And it's those subconscious aspects of consciousness which have strong self-regulatory function. And that's the part in this talk that's, that's relevant, is that those hidden lower level aspects of consciousness which are self-regulatory are what allows us to soothe and kind of um, 
can you know uh, resolve conflict, inner conflict within our minds, and they happen at because they happen at subconscious levels. That's the reason why they're able to work with other subconscious emotions because those emotions already are subconscious. So if we only did this at a conscious level, it would be limiting because our conscious mind can only deal with things that it knows about that it's that is already in our conscious mind, right? And much of our behavior is is deeper, is hidden. Thank you. The other question other that I asked. The other question is, sorry, Shigan, just, just quickly. The other question isn't as important, um, uh, uh, Judith, um, but, but it, what, what I asked is, is uh, if you can give examples of three emotions that commonly arise together. And, and there are many, many, many emotions that can arise together. So thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Mushki. Yes, hi. So I have some comments on this. So you mentioned about the um, how we... Some people say we have three brains, uh, the gut, heart, the mind, brain, and gut. Um, I don't know if it is true, but I was taught about this by someone as a way of using it to deal with conflicting emotions. So for example, um, I love nature and I was in the forest and I was feeling uh, relaxed and calm from the nature, but I was also feeling terrified because I just have anxiety disorder and I was afraid of animals coming to me and it was getting dark. So I said, uh, let me try this idea, listening to mind, brain, and heart. So my mind, my gut was telling me I'm afraid, go. That's what my gut was telling me. Uh, but my heart was telling me I like it here. It's relaxing. So I kind of used my mind to make a compromise to say, okay, stay 10 more minutes, relax, and then you'll go. So I don't know if that applies, but I'm just wondering um, if there's such a thing as the mind, brain, and gut is that like a the head? Is that like a thing? I'm sorry, I'm a bit confused because I always found this concept confusing and a little bit abstract. So I'm wondering if it is a true thing. And I gave it an experience that I had that I tried to deal with this concept. Sure. Um, so yeah, I mean the the concept of a, of a mind, gut, and heart, um, they exist at some level. But when people talk about them, people mostly talk about them metaphorically. They talk about them in very different ways than they actually exist. Um, and the ways that they exist, they're actually not that sophisticated or powerful. They're powerful only if your brain, if, if to the extent that they're tied to our brain. Um, and that depends on the person, on each individual. It also depends on the situation. So if you, the example you gave was you were sitting in an area of nature, maybe a forest near a forest. Um, it was dark, uh, dusk. Um, so your, your gut and your heart don't have any sensory organs, right? They can't sense when it's nighttime or dark. They can't sense where you're sitting. They have no way of getting to the information, right? Your brain is the only organ that has that information. So that information, and your brain can only get that information through your five senses. So your brain will get the information of what, how much sunlight is there, the location you're at, whether there's sounds that sound like animal sounds or not. And it would go into your brain and that information would kind of be coalesced. And maybe it'll be passed on to into our viscera, but our, our gut, which is really more related to digestion and, and processing of, of you know, digestive uh, systems, um, it wouldn't be scared from the outside. All that it would have is it would be either nervous, right? It might feel nervousness if your brain is nervous or fearful, and your, your gut might be nervous. But it's not that the gut is nervous about an animal. It's really that the gut is nervous because your brain is nervous of an animal. That's the simplest way I can explain it. Understood. So the concept of gut instinct, how, how do you think of it? You know, we're, we're often, I, I've had it where gut instinct was correct, and I don't listen to it because I use my brain to, you know, to the logic, and I, I'm wrong. So... Yeah, so when we, when we talk about gut instinct, we, we use the word gut, but actually what it is is it's, it's the lower parts of our brain. So our brain, all of our brain is not logic. Most of our brain is not logical, actually. So if you think of an animal, right? If you think of, of, of every, you know, everyone who has a pet, um, the difference between their pet and a child is that the child has this thing called, called a more developed cortex, but everything else in the child's brain is nearly identical in their pet's brain. So... The pet, everything that pet can do, the child can do, but the child can do a little more if they use their cortex. But it, when the child doesn't use their cortex, they can behave exactly as, a, as, as our pets or any animal would behave. So our thinking brain is actually one part of our brain. The rest of our brain doesn't do any thinking. 
it, it basically acts on think on feeling. So the limbic system is that part of our brain, which is kind of our gut. When we talk about our gut feeling, it's actually our limbic system that we're talking about. It's not, the limbic system is not in our, physically in our stomach. It's physically inside our head. But, okay. you, but metaphorically, or as a euphemism, we refer to it as gut because historically people have talked, talked that way about it. Because our, our limbic system, actually another, there, there's an example I can give. Our limbic system is the main part of our brain which drives our pituitary and endocrine system. And the endocrine system is the part of our body which controls feelings throughout our body. So when we talk about these feelings in our gut, the way it actually happens is that the feelings we feel in our gut are driven by, driven by the pituitary system, which is controlled by the limbic system. So the limbic system is causes those feelings in our gut. So the only way the limbic system can do that is if the limbic system has a feeling about something, it has a fear about something. It translates that fear into um, an effect on pituitary glands, which causes certain hormones to be secreted, which goes into our gut and causes us to feel that way. So in a sense, all the brain activity is happening inside of our brain, but it goes into our body and we feel it in our body. Excellent. Um, thank you, Sanjay. Uh, so Sanjay, this series is working out really well. I think for during every one of these meetups, you're putting down kind of core concepts like today, just kind of appreciating the complexity of the brain and how the, how the complex sub system works, as well as the Evo Devo idea of that, how these parts develop sequentially. Um, and I think this is very good to kind of build up and we're putting it all in the same playlist. So folks, if you have not listened to the previous ones, uh, you can go ahead and go to the 52 Living Ideas YouTube channel. There are six, uh, six videos. This video will be there in a day or so. Um, Sanjay, you have any idea of what you're planning to do next or what are the possible things you're planning to do next? Um, I need to spend some time and actually put a plan together. Sure, sure. Take uh, a time. But, um, I mean, there are many ideas, and if, if people have a specific interest, they can definitely send either Shikan or myself, uh, you know, information about what you're interested to, to, to learn more about. Um, and I'm not an expert in in, in so many areas, but I, I I'm willing to to delve into it and learn myself to to present it to people. But um, you know, I mean, yeah, no, uh, consciousness. Uh, just just to quickly, sure. consciousness is an area that I'm very much interested in personally. Um, and I've been developing my own theories around that. So that's something that I did definitely plan to go into deeper. Um, but because it is so complicated, it will probably take at least three more talks. Mm -hmm. So the challenge here is that, you know, each time that we have these discussions and talks, people need to remember the things from the prior talks mm -hmm. because it builds up. I do some reiteration each one, but it's, it's difficult, you know. So after three or four or five talks, unless you really have built up that, that framework of the concepts, it's going to be difficult to understand that, that last few um, talk. Uh, talk. Sanjay, my recommendation to you is that you can hear what other people have to are interested in, but you should pretty much ignore it in the sense that, uh, in the sense that like you have a much more kind of holistic grasp of this entire field and you have like a map of the field which most people don't have. Like they have like a spotlight. They say, oh, I'm interested in this. But really you can't understand that part until you have the whole thing. And you are very systematically building out the map. So I would recommend that, you know, you just build out the map you think it should be built out. And I think everybody else will, will, will benefit from it, including myself. So this is, this is fantastic.